Good morning, y'all. Good afternoon now. It's officially noon here on the U.S. West Coast. Happy Sunday to everybody. Hope everything's going your way and uh, life is good. And so um, thank you for hanging with that long pre-roll video, that five-minute countdown timer. Those of you who are watching this on replay don't know what I'm talking about because I have finally figured out how to use YouTube's um, editing suite. So now I can go back in about an hour after we're done here and I can edit that countdown timer out. So, <laughs> so you don't know what I'm talking about. You don't see it. It's great, you know. Um, I need to go back into my older videos and do that. But as you can tell by the title of this one, there are 130 live streams. So um, that's going to take me a while to do. Anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, today is uh, an open Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. We've already got a couple out there. And uh, I'm trying out this new thing where from my side, what I can see is your comment and I can click on a little star icon. So that highlights your questions as they come up. And then I can just click over and all I see are the ones with the stars on them. So I see your questions coming up. So we'll get right into the first one which is uh, from Brooks Martin, who wants to know, can I talk about the Keyhole Toolpath gadget in that he's never used it and uh, just kind of wanted to know some general um, knowledge about it. He further says he's got a Dremel. I think he means Dremel bit. I don't think he means a Dermal bit. I mean, that would be yuck. Um <laughs> that might work, but he needs to pocket the slot prior. Um, let me just say, Brooks, that um, as far as the keyhole gadget is concerned, I have never used it. Uh, I have come up with a keyhole toolpath that I use. In fact, I did a video on it a couple of years ago, and I saved two G-code files, one to make a three-quarter inch tall vertical keyhole and another to make about a two inch long horizontal keyhole. And I just saved that G-code. It's on this computer in here. And anytime I need to create a keyhole bit, I just come along and figure out where I want to put that keyhole and put a an X. I find the center of like that three quarter inch vertical keyhole. I'll find, I'll, I'll figure out where I want that keyhole, mark the center of that keyhole, clamp it down and then run my, that G code file and it cuts the keyhole. And it's one of the few pieces of G code that I have saved and reuse. Um, I have never used the keyhole gadget. But um, I can come over here to Aspire and we can show what we're talking about here. Uh, share screen, share, and let's get into Aspire. Um, what he's talking about, this is available. Gadget support is only available in VCarve Pro and Aspire. It is not available in uh, VCarve Desktop. And come over here and click uh, Gadgets and come down here to Keyhole Toolpath. And using this, eh, okay, here, all right. Select a vector. I'll select the outside or the back of this uh, T-shell and click on the Keyhole Toolpath and gadget. And it'll open up this form. And you get in and you decide what kind of keyhole you want. You want it vertical from bottom to top and take a look at this diagram over here and this these diagrams here. Vertical bottom to top, 
which is the most common, or you can go vertical top to bottom, meaning the large portion of the keyhole will be at the top and the slot will be at the bottom. Then horizontal left to right, horizontal right to left. The entry hole diameter, that will be taken from your keyhole bit. The slot diameter, that'll be also taken from the keyhole bit. And then it will create a preview for the outline of the keyhole on the surface of the material here in your 2D view. Then down here where it says tool, this will give you a little clue here. It says set up a dummy end mill to control the feeds and speeds. The problem with a keyhole bit is the same problem you'll have with a dovetail bit is because of the way the software renders previews and does 3D modeling using uh, depth map, bitmap 3D modeling, it will not show or even allow you to enter any bit that creates an undercut. So you have a dovetail bit that's tapered like so, that's creating an undercut. The software won't even allow you to enter that. So what you have to do is, as it says down here, set up a dummy end mill. So it's entered as an end mill using the total diameter, total cutting diameter. And that's how the software reads the tool. Then you can set up a dummy tool, select it, and then enter a tool path name. Now, again, I have never used the gadget. What I did, well, I don't know why I stopped sharing. Let me go back over here and open this up so I can share. Share screen, boom, get back over here into Aspire. What I did was I went into the tool database and I entered, let me find it. Um, maybe I don't have it out here. I guess I don't have it out here. Yeah, I'm going to have to, um, looks like I'm going to have to get in here and enter it again. Yep. I'm going to have to enter it again. I don't have it out here. I set up a, oh, here it is right here. End mill, and I put it in, in the under form tools. End mill, three-eighths of an inch two flute is what it's called. But down here in the notes, I have listed which keyhole bit it is. So I know that it's a keyhole. and. Um, all my cutting parameters and everything else is uh, is entered in here. Then when, as I said, I created this once. I created a project, a small project, ran a keyhole toolpath, and saved that G code, and that's what I use. I, I now I put all of this information into a video that I will put a link to down in the description of this video. And I, I did it a couple of years ago. Now, as far as your, um, your bit is concerned, keyhole bits are cheap. I think I spent... $13. That's a couple of years ago. I think I spent $13 on the keyhole bit. It's not expensive at all. So trying to make do with a Dremel bit or whatever, or uh, do an undercut uh, some other way, the keyhole bit does all the work. Um. Boy, let me see if I can. All right. Stick with me for just a second. I'm going to. Well, no, I can't go get it because it's not in here. It's in the house. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I 
you should have grabbed the keyhole bit. I should have ran into the house and grabbed it before I went live here. Um, the keyhole bit cuts everything. It drills a hole, moves up, comes back, and then lifts out of that same entry hole. So it does all the work. It's it's no big deal. So uh, JR over at Trade Skillers Anonymous, thank you very, very much. Um, I sure appreciate that. I don't know how much knowledge I have. I just try to help people avoid the mistakes that I've made and continue to make. Uh, but thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. Um, so Brooks, uh, in summary, basically I would say invest in a keyhole bit and you'll measure the cutting diameter of the, uh, the large portion of the bit that actually does the plunge. You'll set it up to plunge down in one pass, then move up, make the cut and come back. And you'll do that whether you use the gadget or not. Um, if you use the gadget, it just kind of helps you walk through. But I have found that just by creating that uh, G code file, as I say, I have one for a three quarter inch tall vertical keyhole and one for a two inch wide horizontal keyhole. And whatever I use, whatever is applicable for the situation, that's what I use. And in fact, when I get uh, into the video of actually cutting this T shelf, I will show that because I'm going to put a keyhole in the back of the uh, of the T-shelf so we can hang it up on the wall. If, I say, if my keyhole doesn't go too deep because it's only going to be half-inch material. Speaking of that T-shelf, here's some of the material I'm using on it. This is, this is some of that solid walnut hardwood flooring that I got um, from a friend of ours who had to rip up a whole bunch of solid walnut hardwood flooring after their ice maker sprung a leak. And he asked me, did I want it? And I was like, oh, heck yes. So basically it messed up the finish, but the wood is fine. And uh, that leak was like two years ago. So free material, I'm on it. <laughs> okay. Um, but when I do glue up the panels, uh, which will be happening later this afternoon, uh, I've got to plane them and then square them up and then glue everything up and uh, go for it from there. Okay, let's see. Um, I hope that answers your question, uh, Brooks. Uh, let's see here now. Uh, John Thompson wants to know, can you give the guidelines a certain distance apart without using the dimension icon? Say type in a distance and have it move that far from one to the other. Uh, yes, but you do have to do it one by one, John. And I'll show you what I mean here. Let me take your question down and we'll go back into Aspire. Um, again, you do have to do these one by one. But uh, let's say you have a guideline out here. And I'm not going to put it on my uh, material. But I've got a guideline here, and now I want to put another guideline an inch to the right. I can, to put another guideline, I just put my cursor over that guide, and you see how it turns into left and right facing double arrow. Right click, then come down here to create a new parallel guide. And you can do this one of two ways. You can have it put to an absolute position using coordinates, but I do usually relative to the guide that I right clicked. Now you can select the number right here. So if you want five more guidelines a certain distance apart, we can enter five and I'll just use what's in it. If you want them say an inch apart, we have five guides, one inch apart, create new guides, close, and there are those new guides. Okay? And you can do the same thing with a vertical guide, obviously. Bring one down, right-click, relative to guide, five of them. And because we're moving 
down, I'll go with a negative number, negative one inch, create new guides, close, and there's my guideline. That's a quick, easy way of setting up a grid should you want to. And then again, if you want to hide the guides, just come up and click the corner button and they go away. Click it again to turn them back on. And then if you want to totally delete them, come up to view, guidelines, delete all guides. So that's a quick and dirty explanation of guidelines. And I hope that's what you meant. Because <laughs> if not, I'll have to try again. <laughs> Was that, uh, did that answer your question there, John? Or excuse me. Yes, John. Uh, let's see here. Um, Brooks Martin, thank you very much. Uh, again, keyhole bits are not expensive and, you know, for the price, 13, 14, $15, it's just not worth trying to make do or, you know, uh, trying to work your way around it, you know, so. All right, let's see here. Um, uh, let me go back up here. I'm adding more questions. Um, uh, David Gamant makes a very good point here. He says, keyholes are easy to program in G-code, a good way to learn your first G-code project. That's an excellent point. Uh, I personally have not done that. I didn't program it by writing G code, uh, but it is, it would be a good first G code project. Like I said, I created one vertical keyhole file and one horizontal keyhole file, save them on this computer and I use them whenever I need to put in a keyhole. So that's an excellent point. Um, let's see here. You also wanted to know, is there a way to model a V-carve rather than use the V-carve toolpath? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by model a V-carve rather than use the V-carve toolpath. You can, and I have done it in the past, and in fact, I showed it in a video on how to, uh, carve open vectors. Um, let me write a note here to myself to post a link to that in the description of this video when we get done live here. And that is to select the vector and go into a profile toolpath, select the bit, and you'll have to select your own cut depth. So if you want this to be, let's say, a 16th of an inch deep, uh, or what would that be? That would be like a millimeter and a half, maybe two millimeters. I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, you would select the vectors, and they don't have to be closed. They can be open vectors. And then put in your cut depth, select the V-bit, and down in the uh, blank for, let's see, what is it called? It's called uh, machining vectors. You want to machine on the vector. So not to the outside, not to the inside. You want to machine on the vector. And that will have the effect of coming down and cutting that right on that uh, vector. The drawback is you will not get square corners like you would if, for instance, if you wanted a outline, just a square outline around uh, another piece of artwork in the center, your better bet would be to figure out how wide you wanted that cut and then create two rectangles that distance apart, you know, the offset that much from one another. And then V-carve, select both rectangles and V-carve that. Then you'll get square corners. But if you select the vector and do a profile toolpath on the vector, you will not get square corners. You will have that rounded 
uh, radius there of the bit. Now, if you check sharp external corners, it won't round them off. It will do a sharp corner, but you won't have the square corners that you'll get with a V-carve toolpath. If, uh, I hope that answers your question, but that is the number one way to go ahead and like carve, um, carve open vectors or not use the v-carve tool path um it if you i can't think of a situation where i wouldn't want to use the v-carve tool path i mean um obviously if you can't because you can't close vectors for some reason that will work but uh no, no. Okay. Uh, GM Taylor says, how did you delete all guides at once? Go up to the view menu and the menu will drop down, go to guidelines and there's a arrow. It'll open up a sub menu and right there said, delete all guides. And uh, that deleted them, got rid of them at all. So, if you just need to hide them, that square up in the corner by the two rulers, um, it's it, it just hides them. It doesn't delete them. So let's go back up here and see if I got them. Uh, yeah, I think I did. Uh, okay, so... If I didn't answer your question, David, please let me know. Okay. Uh, Edward Thomas Cigar says, is there a way to 3D machine different regions of the same model to different depths? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, that's kind of open-ended. Uh, if you... Okay. Um, a lot of that will be done in the modeling tools. If you want certain depths to retain those depths, but want to bring a top surface down, uh, that's done in the modeling tools. If you're talking about maybe tilting a model, you know, that's done also in the modeling tools. That'll get into your tilt and or fade, but taking it a flat model and adjusting certain heights within that model, that will be done in your shape height. So that's on the modeling side. Uh, and the person to contact on that would be Michael Mazalik. He has forgotten more about 3D modeling than I have. And uh, I'm kind of surprised he's not here. I will put a link to Michael's um, YouTube channel down in the description of this video. And um, he would be the person to talk about on that. And if you can get a little bit more specific, I might be able to do it. But um, Michael is my 3D modeling Obi-Wan. <laughs> Okay, here's what he says. I want to machine a fillet around the outer edge, but not fully machined down. Okay, that would be an added component. And if you're using a spire, um, you can do that either with a two-rail sweep. You could do it with a molding tool path. I would tend to use it probably a uh, two-rail sweep to create that fillet. And that would incorporate it into the model and make it uh, a part of that model. You just have another component there. And, um, but again, I would talk to Michael about that. I am not very good at 3D carving uh, or 3D designing. I'm just getting into it. Um, I just haven't been uh, able to sit down and spend the time to actually focus on it but um 
Yeah, that would be the way to go would be to create that component and add it into your component tree. So uh, let's see here. I hope that answered that question. Um, let's see. Daniel Thompson says, I'm building a new 4x4 CNC rotary axis with router with Mach 3. What type of breakout board do I use? My setup is obsolete technology. I use a uh, four-axis Xylotex drive box, which is no longer made. I have opened that drive box one time to blow it all out right after the move. I don't know what breakout boards are in it. I don't know what drivers are in it. I've never paid attention to that. The way I have my rotary axis set up is I unplug, okay, back up, regroup. My gantry is moved on with two motors. So I have a Y motor and a what is supposed to be the A motor plugged in also, and it's slaved off the Y. So when the Y moves, the A moves right along with it. When I set up my rotary axis, I put my gantry into position, get it set and lined correctly over my rotary axis. I then shut off Mach 3, power down the controller, unplug that A axis motor and plug it into my rotary axis, then open a new Mach 3 profile for the rotary axis. The gantry will not move. Now that A is turning the rotary axis. So it uses the same breakout board controller, everything as the slave motor for the Y axis. I did have to go back in and change the settings for steps per unit and what have you, because a rotary axis works off of degrees instead of a, um, a linear measurement, so many inches per minute or what have you. It uh, goes with degrees per step. And I did a couple of videos on that, but uh, it may or may not be applicable to your case. But as far as which breakout board I used, it's all internal in that drive box. And uh, I have to claim ignorance on that. I didn't build the drive box. I've never built a CNC controller in my life. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> So, uh, let's see. Um, let me get down here and see if there are any more new questions that I'm adding to the list. Um, boink. Let's see. Um, Gary, where is the link for questions? All I see are links to videos and support. Um, I don't know what you're referring to if you're talking to somebody else. Uh, but if you have a question, just post that question right here in the comments. If that was directed at me, I'm not sure. Okay, let's see. Um, let me go back over here and do that. And uh, Muhammad wants to know, can you please share some info about ornamental 3D designing? That is very open-ended. Um, I'm going to refer you again to Michael Mazalik's YouTube channel. He is a 3D wizard. And um, I will put a link in the description of this video as soon as we're finished live. Give me about 10 minutes after we're done live here. Uh, he's running complete series on ornamental 3D designing and carving. He is truly an artist and has been using the 3D modeling for well over 10 years that I know of. So I apologize for not having the info for you, but <laughs> uh, let's see here. Peterson's Country Woodworking, Troy. How are you doing, Troy? See, he says, I needed to add a bit to the tool menu, but Freud does not have the bit drawing or file to enter it in the tool menu. 
suggestions? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir, I do. Um, this is one of the things that caused companies like Whiteside and Amana and Magnate to create DXF files with their tool profiles and to eventually create tool files that you could download and install in your tool database. Lacking that tool file or a, um, a DXF that shows the profile, sorry to say you're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way, which is a lot of measuring, possibly some tracing, but you're going to have to draw that profile yourself. If it's a simple cove bit or roundover bit, that's fairly simple. Um, you can just do a lot of measuring. As I said, I've got a little, I got a machinist rule that sticks with me. I've got another one in uh, on my design computer in the house. And I get in and I measure and I use calipers and everything else and figure out where a radius goes, what that radius is, and you basically draw that vector into vCarver Aspire and you want the right side. Draw that in on the right side of that profile in there and when you enter that form tool, use that vector. Make sure all your vector segments are joined. You want one open vector. And that will be how you enter that bit into the tool database. Alternatively, you can look for a tool file or a DXF file that contains the, the profiles of the bits. You can look for something that's very similar. For instance, if it's a dovetail bit, if it's a 22 degree dove, 22 and a half degree dovetail bit, you can pretty much figure that they're, for the most part, all alike. 22 and a half degrees is 22 and a half degrees, no matter who made the bit. But if, if, it, if it's an uncommon profile, like some sort of an OG bit or something like that, you're going to have to get creative and draw it in yourself. Um, I have also laid the car. I don't have anything here. To use as an example, I'm going to start bringing some bits over here so I don't have to sit down. I've even gone so far as to take a notepad and lay that carbide cutter on top of the notepad, trace it with a pencil, and then scan that in and use it to draw the vector. Because it'll give me, I mean, it's not perfect, but it'll get you close. Um, and send a uh, email to Freud and see if they will send you a DXF file of that profile. They have them. That's how they make them. Um, you know, th this is another case of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So enough of us start asking companies like Freud or CMT or Bosch or any of the other bit makers, if enough of us start asking for this stuff, they'll do it. I mean, they ought to do it. The, we're their customers. And if they don't do it, that's what sends people to the manufacturers who do. So by all means, I mean, send them a message. So um, I'm sorry that's not the answer. I'm sure that's not the answer you were looking for. But hopefully um, that uh, hopefully that answers the question. So let's see. Let me get over here again. And Danny Garcia says, what do you think about 3D relief carving? I did a 3D carving, but it took several hours. I'm not sure how to justify the cost. Very common. Um, and I'm with you. I'm in the same boat. You have a big 3D carving. How the heck do you charge for 14 or 15 or more hours of machine time? You know, yeah, uh, it, it's not that way. It's not this way anymore. But when I first got into CNC, shops were charging $125 an hour for machine time. How do you charge for that on a 14 hour car? You can't really. Uh, you know, um, it's now going to be based on the uh, budget of the 
client or customer. But anymore, I don't really see. I don't sell most of my projects. Most of my projects are made for family or friends. But on the few times that I have been contacted about doing 3D projects, I will kind of get a rough guesstimate as to how long that project is going to take, quote them a price. And if they want to, if they're willing to pay for it, I'm willing to cut it. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's very difficult to make money on 3D carvings. And that's why a lot of shops just simply won't do it because it's not worth their while to dedicate a machine for 14, 15 hours and not get paid for it so it's it's very very difficult to make money on 3d carving unless somebody really has to have it so i know that's probably not the answer you're looking for <laughs> but um that's what i have found ah oh, boy it's just a whew <laughs> it's crazy sometimes uh let's see what we have here we have paul rothwell saying hi mark regarding the resin inlay projects am i right in saying they are only viable on 2d and not 3d i have a detail which shows a wavy flag can this still be done to show a wavy flag in 2d that is something I have not gotten into. I would, uh, I expect him to drop in when he gets home. I would send that question to Rob Sandstrom and I will link him uh, in the description of this video as soon as we're done live here. I could see how you could do it. All right. Now, let me throw a caveat in here and say, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I could see how you could pour a deep epoxy inlay and then come along and do a shadow, wa shallow, wavy flag. I can see how that could be done. But you would have to pour all of your epoxy first, make sure it's cured nice and pretty, and then come in and carve those waves into it. Um, because the problem you have is gravity. You wouldn't be able to pour that epoxy after you cut the waves because how do you keep the epoxy up on the top and get it to follow the contour? So you would have to pour the epoxy first. I could see theoretically how it could be done and you would have to make sure that the model depth, the relief of the waves were shallower than your epoxy pour. But that's that would be something to run past Rob and let him run it past Shane and th let those two work on. I'm still working on my first epoxy in my it's just the T shelf kind of got jumped in front of it because I've been promising it for too long with no activity on it. So sorry. <laughs> we'll get back to the epoxy very, very soon though. Okay, let's see. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, though. Uh, let's, you know, here's hoping. Okay, let me, Brooks Martin says, I've done 3D models in epoxy. There's your man. Get together. <laughs> um, yeah, Andrew W. has a good point here. 3D carving is mostly for the enjoyment of the project for personal use of friends, et cetera. That's been my experience too. I tried to charge $35 an hour and customer told me to hit the road. Yeah, and you're not making any money at $35 an hour. Uh, just the project planning costs at least that. Oh, easily, easily. You know, because you're dedicating a machine for the entire day. Now, you have to make a certain amount of money every day to stay in business, keep the lights on, and still eat. So you can't do that if you're charging $50 for something that took 10 hours to cut. You're not even getting minimum wage out of that. If you're making enough to keep the lights turned on, you're lucky. You know, 
And that's not even getting into design time and tool pathing and all that other stuff and correspondence, sending previews back and forth and getting approvals and this, that, and the other. It can take, it can take a month before you ever put the first piece of material down on your table. You need to be paid for all of that, you know? Um, again, unless you're doing this for friends, family, as a gift, something like that, you know? Yeah. And screw ups. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Andrew aspire alone needs to get paid for somehow 100%. Now there are some models you can create once be done with it. And if you're making certain things repeatedly over and over and over again, let's say you're making um, chess sets, you can create one 3D model for each piece and you can run those at your leisure. Figure out your overhead, see what it's going to cost, and then price them accordingly. And clients will buy them or not, as the case may be. My philosophy has always been that the letter S in the word custom should be a dollar sign. Because you are going to pay extra. The client is going to pay extra if they want custom. I mean, that's just all there is to it. So the other thing is to watch your market and see what other people are charging for their work and charging for their items. And I've told a few people this, you don't want Walmart or pound shop shoppers. You can't compete with them. Don't try. What you want is the higher end shopper. And if folks are coming in trying to get a $200 piece for $25, I'm sorry, I just can't help you. And I don't think I can work with you. I apologize, but I can't do it. So uh, let's see here. Let me go back up. Um, Tom Miller wants to know, can you recommend any CNC bits for the Vectric threading toolpath? Not at this time, but watch this space. More on that as things unfold. Let's just say there's a lot of things going on in the background. And thread milling is just one of them. But right now, I can't recommend a bit. I can't recommend tool work holding or anything like that. But watch this space. That will be coming soon, and I can't tell you when. So uh, let's see. Uh, David Gamet. Did I say your name, Gamet? I apologize, David. I butcher names. That's my thing. Uh, how can you accurately use a cove bit to put a radius on the top edges of a model? Can you demonstrate? Uh, I'll have to make a note of that and get back to you. That may be something to explore down the road. But generally speaking, that's going to have to be treated as a separate design element and done after the model is assembled. Because uh, remember, when you're talking about modeling in a spire, you're making a composite model and each component you put in there is going to affect other components within the stack up. On that point, let me show something in Aspire that um, a lot of people don't know about. Let me get in here. I'm assuming you're using Aspire because I don't think you would be uh, using VCAR for this, but it, I think this is the same in VCarve. If you come down into your clip art library, let's go into the clip art here. What I'm going to say is look for something that already does what you want it to do. If, if, it's, if you can find something similar. Um, I'm going to go into decorative because I know there are certain things in here that do follow this. Um, and what you're looking for um, is I'm looking for and now I'm not finding any, of course. I'm looking for elements. Well, maybe. 
Uh, nope, none of these are. What you're looking for is you you see how the title opens up in that little bubble. What I'm looking for is a title that has an X as part of the title. Um, let me see. I don't think there are anything. Gosh, now that I want an example of something with an X in the title, I'm not finding anything. Uh, oh, come on, Mark. Because the models that have an X in their title are made up of separate components. Yeah, and I can't find one now. Boy, oh, howdy. Yeah. Um, helmet and plumes, nope. The items that have an X in their title are made up of separate components that you can strip out and use one by one. And now I can't find one to demonstrate. Let's look in ribbons and banners. No, nope, that's nothing there. Wow. Uh, get into weaves. Nope. Well, the last character will be an X. And of course, I can't find one now to save me. But what they are is they are um, – I can't think of the word now. Let's put one of these in here and go into the modeling tool path and see. Yeah, that's just one single component. Composite models, that's the word I was trying to think of. If they have an X – let me delete that and get rid of it. If they have an X in their name, they are composite models. And some of these models will have 13, 14, 15 different elements that you can get into and strip off separate pieces of and use them in other models. Uh, I, I wish I could find an uh, example right now, but I can't find an example right now to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I will do a video on that, however. That's one of the things that I've I've got coming down the pike. Um, but as far as using a cove bit to put a radius on the top edge of a model, there are a couple of ways of doing that, and it would just be set as a another tool path outside of the model. I'm guessing what you're talking about is you want let's say for the sake of argument you want to cut a circle that has a 3d model carved down into it and then put that cove around the outside well that would just be a a simple cove um you would want to do create a vector and then carve to the inside of that vector with the cove bit uh or you could model it separately um but um you know, I know that's not a very good answer, but again, without seeing exactly what you want to do, um, you know, that's it's that's about the best I can say. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's see. Um, um, Let's see, Reload and Shoot says, sometimes you do things just because I'll never, ever pay for my tools, never intended to sell a thing. And that's going to, you know, that, that goes back to what you are doing this for. If this is your hobby, you know, uh, a lot of people say they can't justify spending $5,000 on a machine, just for instance, and then $2,000 on software for a hobby. But we know people that have spent $30,000 on a boat to use two, three, four times a year or eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollars $100,000 on an RV to use two or three times a year. It just depends on where your priorities are. If it's something you enjoy doing, it doesn't need to pay for itself. If it's a business investment, yes, it does need to. It does need to pay for itself. So... 
Okay, let's see here. Um, get down here and see. Uh, get a couple of uh, more questions down here. Um, all right, let me go back over here to the ones I already have. Uh, Wolfram Herzog, can you rotate an imported bitmap in VCarve? Yes, and you would do that the exact same way you would uh, rotate a vector. Just import a bitmap, click it once to select it, click it a second time to go into move and transform mode, and use the square black square corners on the outside of the bitmap, or you can just select the bitmap and over under um, under um, transform objects, you have uh, rotate selected objects. And you do that for rotating bitmaps, rotating vectors, anything. So uh, let's see here. Get back over here and make sure that I'm not losing um well that's the way i read it rob um i know guys who build race cars and they've got if they were to total everything up they probably have a couple hundred thousand dollars invested in the tool the tools the shop the car you know um ten thousand dollars for a transmission i mean you know so it just depends on what your priorities are. Now, I get it. I understand. The whole family can go out on the boat or can go out in the RV. So, you know, it's not a single person enterprise. But, you know, I mean, uh, Brooks also makes a great point. Uh, you can also rotate a bitmap by using the number nine or the number zero up on the keyboard above the letters, not over on the number pad. For some reason, that doesn't work. At least it doesn't on my computer. Your mileage may vary on that. But select the object, whether it be a vector or a bitmap, and you can use the number nine to rotate it one direction or the number zero to rotate it the other direction. So, and it will turn a a predetermined amount with each time you press it. So, oh, excuse me, my nose itches. Excellent point. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, Rob's, <laughs> Rob says, yeah, the whole family can look at my carvings. True. But then again, they know they're going to get something out of it because chances are you're going to make them something. I mean, you know, so what can you say? Um, David Donaldson says, Mark, can you recommend offset settings when V carving raised letter text? Ooh, I suppose it would be different depending upon how tall the text is. For instance, text one eighth inch tall. That is something I have not yet perfected myself, David. It also depends not only on the, how, the height of the text, it also depends on the diameter of the bits you're going to be using to cut. Because if you're leaving raised text, um, you've got the text height, but you also have an offset for the clearance passes, unless you're using uh, the V-bit for your clearance. So you draw your text, then you have to uh, convert that text to curves, then letter by letter, individually go through an offset out i usually go for instance if i'm doing a using a 1 8 inch end mill i will offset out a 16th of an inch so that my end mill can get right up there and clear right next to that raised letter i always 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 run my v bit first doesn't matter if I'm doing a normal V-carve toolpath, if I'm doing uh, a, uh, a chamfer like around the edge of text or what have you. I always, always, always run my V-bit first. 
That way, you've got the full thickness of the material to trace the outline and hug that letter. Then come back and clear it out. If you clear it out first and you try to put a chamfer on the top of that letter, all it takes is one little hit in the wrong area to watch a piece of your text go flying across the shop. And trust me, that's happened to me a lot. So I always, always, always run the V-bit first, then come back in clearance afterwards. So um, I have not perfected it yet, so I'd be a little bit hesitant to give you any offset. But my general rule of thumb is to use half the diameter of the clearance bit that I'm going to use. And um, if that means I have to, for instance, if I've got small text in a large area, I might have to offset outwards and use that one eighth of an inch clearance tool around the letter, then offset out again and use a quarter inch end mill to clear out the rest of it. Now, that can complicate things. And that could mean you have different machine marks down in the bottom of your pocket. But um, that's why I use that uh, last pass in the pocket tool path to machine off a very fine amount to get all the bit deflection over with and everything. I do like a 20, I leave 20 thousandths of my final pass in that pocket is 20 thousandths of an inch. So it's skimming off just a little amount. And there's zero bit deflection that way. That helps. It does. It's not perfect, but it helps. So um, we're, oh boy, we're on an hour right now. I'm going to have to be able, I'm just going to have to, um, to uh, take this one more question and then call that done. Um, Brooks Martin has an excellent point. Spindle TV covered that this week with the raised text. Uh, I will look for that and put a link to it um, in the description of this video. Um, just wrote myself a note. Lainey Shaughnessy is a good instructor. Um, I would definitely get over and uh, subscribe. Excuse me. Subscribe to his channel. Um I didn't mention it uh, when he popped in. Uh, Rob, Rob Sandstrom is here at Generations Custom Creations. Uh, I will talk to him later in the week about your question about a epoxy inlay wavy 3D flag. That would be interesting. Um, like I said, in theory, it can be done, but... By all means, get over to Rob's YouTube channel right here, Generation Custom Creations, and uh, subscribe, and uh, you will learn a lot. I mean, he did a video this morning on uh, the different V-bits that he and Shane Peters both used for epoxy inlays. Excellent video. We're talking suppliers, part numbers when you would use it, when you wouldn't use it, things like that. Excellent video. Get over there and give it a watch and subscribe. Believe me, it's well worth it. Um, I agree, Andrew. Rob has an awesome channel. Uh, let's see. One last question, then we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, Wolfram Herzog wants to know any suggestions how to trace the contours of tools if I want to cut some tool inlays for a toolbox drawer. I tried to scan them, but the resulting bitmaps did not convert to anything useful. Uh, another video I'm going to link in the description of this when we get done. Um, my friend in New Zealand, Peter Pasuelo on his channel, CNC Nuts, did a video on just this topic where he had an adjustable wrench. I'll use my scissors as an example. Took a photo and showed how he lit it, how he positioned himself, took a photo of it, imported that photo into VCarve, used bitmap trace, 
and cut out a tool holder for, he did it with an adjustable wrench, but he went through the entire process on how to do it because there is no one size fits all answer. Sometimes scanning doesn't do it. Sometimes a photo does. And he offers tips and tricks to get a good bitmap so you can trace it. And I've done it. I just didn't do a video on it because Peter already did it. So, um, um, I'll, I'm making a note right now to put a link to that video down in the description of this video as soon as we're done going live here. Um, and that's another person I would highly recommend subscribing to is Peter Pasuelo over on his channel, CNC Nuts. When you check out this video, subscribe to his channel. He is the first CNC uh, router, CNC person that I subscribe to. And I have learned more from that man than I can, I can quantify. He really, really, really does a good job and puts it into layman's terms that anybody and everybody can understand. Also, just as a, um, just as a uh, little added bonus, if you happen to use the uh, metric system, he does everything in metric. <laughs> So, um, I am trying to remember to put metric equivalents in my videos. Sometimes things slip through. Um, if I'm got, if I keep using the same measurement over and over again, like I say a quarter of an inch, I'll put the metric equivalent in there one time, but I won't keep doing it every single time I say quarter inch because I figure you got it. You understand. So, okay, um, we're going to go ahead and call that good, wrap this one up. I'm already over an hour. Um, next week, I have part two of the, I think it's part two, part two of the T-Shelf project. The video is already shot. It's already uploaded. It's already closed captioned and subtitled and translated into 11 languages other than English. And it's ready to go. We will get into taking all those vectors and splitting them off and putting them onto sheets, then calculating tool paths for each of those sheets, and then generating and saving G code to come out here and cut them on the CNC router. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I'm getting ready this afternoon to plane this walnut flooring down to the right dimension, glue up these panels, and uh, start cutting the project itself. So hopefully when the next part of this project video is due to come out, I'll be ready for it. <laughs> we'll see. Then I can knock one more thing off of the honeydew list and hopefully get go fishing up closer to the top but we'll see how that works out um if you have any comments or questions feel free to put them in the comment section to this video i see every comment that comes in and i read every single comment that comes in i just there are too many for me to answer every single comment and say thank you and thank you for watching. But believe me, I do read them. And I do answer questions in the comments. Um, other than that, I don't think I have any other inside baseball or behind the scenes stuff. Other than what I've got going on here. Um, yeah, that's going to do it. So, uh, David, welcome aboard. Thank you very much for the praise. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's um, I, I'm just here to try to help folks avoid the mistakes I make. And um, if I help somebody out, that's the whole point. That's the whole purpose. Uh, I thank you very much. I think everybody who has hit those super chats 
and everybody who has hit those donation links down in the description of all my videos. I appreciate you folks more than you will ever know. And uh, until next week, I want to say thanks for watching and new video next week. Yeah, that's everything. So y'all go out and do something. Go make some chips. Clean up the shop. I mean, whatever. Let's get out and enjoy. Spring is coming. <laughs> y'all take care.